Hello and welcome. My name is Dexter Fedor, and I'm a 1979 graduate of Washington University in St. Louis. I was the first to graduate with degrees from the School of Art in Design and the School of Business in Marketing. I spent the first half of my career as a creative director in advertising agencies. I'm a triple Clio Award winner uh, for Best Commercial of the Year and a medalist at the Cannes Film Festival. While at the Walt Disney Studio, I was Senior Vice President of Marketing and I'm currently Vice President at Warner Brothers, Head of Marketing and Brand Creative for Turner Classic Music. On behalf of the WashU Alumni Association, I'm excited to welcome alumni, parents, and students, and friends to this Discover Los Angeles event. Our diverse audience is tuning in from coast to coast, 18 states and Canada. We hope you're able to get to know Hollywood through the eyes and the experiences of Sherry and Loris. Um, before we begin, I'd like to explain the format for today's session. You will only hear and see me and our speakers. The webinar will last one hour. Following the conversation, we will have time for questions. We encourage you to participate by asking questions at any time using the Q&A function. Thanks to all of you who already submitted your questions. We received a lot of them. We'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can during this event but I assure you, you won't be disappointed in the experience and wealth of knowledge and personalities of Laura and Sherry. The webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the Alumni Association YouTube channel following this event. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce and welcome alumni Sherry Pollock and Laura Gooden. Sherry Pollock is an award-winning four-time Emmy-nominated writer, director, and animator. Just some of her credits include Disney's Amphibia, Mickey Mouse Clubhouse, and Pepper Ann, Nickelodeon's Rocco Modern Life Movie, Fairly Odd Parents, Dora the Explorer, DreamWorks The Crudes, and Cartoon Network's We Bear Bears movie and series, and much more. In addition, her work in primetime television and features include The Simpsons, God, The Devil and Bob, and Fern Gully. Her work inspires and appeals to many audiences and she relishes the challenge. Laura Guten Peterson is also Emmy nominated as the writer, executive producer on ABC's hit sitcom, Blackish. Previously, her writing and credits include NBC's The Carmichael Show, Enlisted on Fox, and Bojack Horseman on Netflix. She lives in Los Angeles with her husband and two children, and she tells me that she is very tired. So to start with some questions, I'm just going to begin with uh, with you, Sherry. Can you share the start of your path into animation and then later into writing, Laura? And specifically, what kind of risks have you taken? Sure, I'm happy to be here. So nice to uh, hear and see you all, sort of, kind of. Um, I never thought I was going to be an animator. I was going to be um, a zookeeper or Carol Burnett. That's, that's really what I was headed toward. And um, I ended up at Washington University you know, um, in fine arts and also taking a lot of theater classes. And I graduated and went to Chicago to be an art director on commercials. And um, what that meant was they gave me some brown food coloring and I got to doctor up some Arby sandwiches. And that just wasn't enough for me, it wasn't. So I went home back to St. Louis. And again, I wasn't thinking about animation but I decided I would create a comic strip. And I was sitting in my old bedroom and drawing these panels and I looked at these and I thought these should move. That's animation. But I was in St. Louis and I looked in something called a phone book and, I, and there was one little tiny line that said Ryan Animation Studio. And I called this guy on something called a telefono. And he said, yes. And I said, you should hire me. And he said, really? And that began everything. And then I went to a place called a library and looked up animation and found a book. And I found someone's name, uh, Robert Edmonds. And he was teaching at, um, Chicago, in Chicago. And he said, we need one more person to go to Europe with us. Why don't you come with us and decide if you want to do animation? And I made a little flip book and I went and I got a job in Belgium animating chickens. And I lied my way into it. I didn't know animation, but I could draw. And um, uh, my work permit did not come through. 
And they said, well, just marry the Xerox guy. <laughs> I couldn't do that. So I went back to St. Louis and then I went straight to Los Angeles and started drawing on commercials. And um, that's, what, that's what began everything for me. That's great. Laura? Uh, well, I uh, studied English with a concentration in writing at WashU, but I didn't, I, I thought that I would go to journalism school and maybe write a novel. And then when I was studying abroad my junior year, every night, everyone would get together in our dorms TV room to watch The Simpsons. And after The Simpsons one night, a friend said to me, what are you going to do after school? And I said, I don't, I don't know, something with writing. And they pointed at the TV and said, you can write TV, people do that. And it was like a bomb went off in my brain. I had never considered it. I didn't really think about it being a job that people did, but once this person said it, I just knew that's what I wanted to do. And so I came back senior year and I just said, I'm gonna write for television. I'm gonna write for television. Uh, I talked to a cousin who lived in LA and she said, well, if you wanna write for television, you should really move to LA. And so then I said, okay, I'm gonna write for television in LA. Uh, and I packed up the car a couple of weeks after graduation and moved out with my dad. Uh, and when we finally got to my new apartment, I thought, oh, I've made a huge mistake. Uh, so I guess in terms of taking a, when you asked what risk did you take, I think I mean moving across the country. I didn't have a job. Uh, I just had a little bit of uh, maybe just dumb faith that things would work out. And uh, I got here and I got my first TV job as the set PA and the accounting assistant. So like I answered the phones on the set and I filed things and I put paychecks in envelopes and I, I was just in love with it. And that was the beginning of, of my journey. And I haven't looked back. That's great. You know, both of you are incredible storytellers and, and build and known for that. So if I were to ask you, what is the inspiration for your stories? One, Laura, since we're on you, why don't you uh, tackle that one? Uh, you know, it, it's everything around me. Uh, honestly, you know, 20 years into writing, people will start telling a story and then they'll stop and they'll say to me, you're not gonna put this in the show, are you? And I go, well, we'll see. Um, you know, I mean, before COVID, when you could go out and be in the world, I would eavesdrop on people at the mall. I just love listening to people's stories and collecting them and finding ways to weave that together and make something funny. It's so great. Watch out. <laughs> <laughs> and Sherry, what about, what about inspiration for your stories you tell? Um, there was a rule in my house when I was growing up that we had to read a book a week. We had to learn to play music and we had to walk around with our eyes open. And I always hold on to that. Everything is material as far as I'm concerned. And I remember as a little kid, when um, everyone was starting to show their personalities, um, I was literally taking notes. And I would do that by drawing pictures. I drew little caricatures of people. If I saw something go on at a playground and bullies were, were, were chasing a kid, I would stop what I was doing, pull out my little pad of paper and draw this little kid running after another kid. And it was just everything, um, I, never, I never lost that. And even when I, even fast forward when I was teaching, you know, if, if uh, sometimes um, I would be teaching an, an animation class and the kids were wanting to do video games and it was mostly guys and they would have a video game of a, of a woman dressed in her panties with a spear running around. And I'd say, why is she in her panties? And he said, well, they all are. And I said, well, why don't you think twice? If you want to compete in this business, you have to be different than everybody else. Give her a reason. She is running after the guy who took her clothes. That's why she's, I mean, come on. You know, it's, it's got to, there has to be a beginning, middle, and end. There's always a why and a story. And so that's, um, my inspiration is just walking around with my eyes open, frankly. Um, what is the, uh, what is, how does your personal, philosophies about the way you work, the way you live, the way you see the world. How does your personal philosophy affect your art, Sherry? Um, I was a big fan of Aristotle. And there was a little, again, I had to read a book a week and my dad had a little pocketbook of Aristotle. And I remember reading this thinking, everything comes from character and story and they're related. And so if, some, if, if, I'm, if I'm working and um, Marge and Homer are having an argument. I wanna think in terms of why are they responding the way they're responding? And I go back to Aristotle all the time. 
It all comes from who they are and what they've been through. And I can honestly tell you, that's how I look at everything that I'm working on. Everything has to come from, you always go back to the mother. What happened? What happened? Why are they feeling this way? And so I know that's kind of convoluted, but that's really, I'm never stuck. I never have um, uh, writer's block. I never have it. There's always material, but basically there's always mishigas. There's always craziness that goes on behind. I hope mm. that makes sense. <laughs> Absolutely no sense. Thank you, Sherry. Listen, <laughs> Laura, why don't you take that? Well, how does your personal philosophy affect your work? Uh, you know, I... Uh... I think probably my personal philosophy is that everything can be comedy if you look at it the right way. Um, I think that that's always been my tendency when things are really hard. You know, uh, how do you, how do you change your perspective so that you can find what's funny about this? Because as a writer now, writing sitcoms for network television, you know, if you're experiencing something, odds are somebody else out there is experiencing it too, and you know, maybe if you present it in a different way, they can look at their situation and go, oh, you know, I was feeling really bad, but actually I can look at this now and laugh at it and put it in a smaller box that isn't so daunting. And so, you know, whether it was this past year of COVID being home with two small children and just finding those little moments, I think for me, it was a, a really a way to change the way I was experiencing it and find the humor so that I could put one foot in front of the other every day. And we do, I do that in my writing all the time. How do we tell thorny stories in a funny way? Um, you know, I just uh, want to reflect back people's experience of the world through a funny lens. So that's always the goal. Great. You know, it, it's funny when you mentioned that you first started telling those stories, Laura, when you landed in Hollywood and you kind of saw the path before you, did you know that you wanted to be a prime time television writer? How did you get there? Well, I mean, back then, really all there was was prime. There was like prime time. And, you know, if you wanted to write sitcoms, that was it. There, this was before really there wasn't a ton of cable. There wasn't streaming, you know, back then every year, they make TV pilots for consideration in like March and April, and then uh, things get picked up and there's something called staffing season in May where people get jobs. And then if you didn't get a job during staffing season, good luck next May. Uh, and it was terrifying. And things have changed now with streaming and cable and network. And, you know, now there's stuff going on all the time. But, you know, so when I got here, I just was like, I love network sitcoms. That's what I want to do. And I, there were way more of them at the time. And so I just started working my way up and I answered phones here and I got lunches there. Uh, I got yelled at a lot. Could not seem to work an alarm my first year, which was very embarrassing. Embarrassing. I was like, I'm an adult. I have a paycheck. I am late for work all the time. It was very bad. Um, but as I kept moving, I was writing my own stuff on the side. And I was a writer's assistant where I was in the writer's room taking notes for the writers and typing all the scripts and a script coordinator, which is just a fancier title. Uh, and all that time I was writing and writing. And I finally had something to give to a friend who had been promoted to being an agent. And he said, okay, let's do this. And then it was, again, it was a scary jump. I said, I'm not gonna be that person on the keyboard working for the writers anymore. I'm a writer now. And, uh, and then we started that part of the journey of just going out and tap dancing until somebody liked what they saw and I got my first writing job. Yeah. And so Sherry, you, you managed to write, direct and animate. Did you know that you were gonna land in one of those spaces or had a goal to get to one of those spaces? What was your path? Um, I was very, um... I did a lot of acting when I was growing up and I was in improv comedy and always doing that. So I lost my pride early on. So I, I would do anything. I was, um, I remember um, I decided to go to film school and I called UCLA and I said, how do I apply? And the lady in admissions say, don't, it's very competitive. Well, so I went ahead and applied anyway. And um, as soon as I was in there, there was a job board that said, for beginning animators, go to a place called Klasky Chupo. They were starting a little show called The Simpsons. We were all students. And I thought, well, this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna be an animator. And then I went to another studio to pick up a freelance job and they, they gave me a pencil and they said, you're not gonna draw, you're gonna start directing now. And again, cause full disclosure, um, we used to call that just being honest. They said, um, I, I said, you know, I can, I'm, I'm, I'm an animator, I'm not a director. And they said, no, you're a director. And I just went for it. 
And then they said, now you're going to write and now you're going to do this. And so what I always tell students also when I teach is um, don't be close minded, learn everything, definitely learn everything. And so as as I started going forward, I realized um, this is the best way to be a filmmaker. You're learning animation is is uh, filmmaking frame by frame. You know, the big difference is in the script, it might say an exterior shot of a mountain. In animation, we have to build the mountain before you put the camera in front of it. So you have to be a special kind of crazy to do this. But who's who saved Hollywood in the beginning of the pandemic? Animation, we never stopped working. We're exhausted, but we never, we never stopped working. And when you think about it, it's everywhere. You go to Vegas, you look at the slot machines, they're animated. Hmm. <laughs> so, you know, there was, I think, I think what it comes down to, this is my long way of saying, just be courageous. And if you're not, just pretend you are acting, take an acting class, fake it. <laughs> Thank you. You know, both of you are uh, at the top of your game. And uh, in the chat, I can see a lot of people are asking the million dollar question in Hollywood. So tell us, uh, Laura, tell us how you, what's your best networking advice? How do you meet the people you want to meet to kind of help you get to where you want to get? Um, that's a great question. I think my best advice is don't be a jerk. Uh, it's, it's, see, it's elementary, but you'd be shocked at how many people can't manage it. Uh, this, this business is, is all about relationships. Um, I've written on 15 shows. I've worked in total on 24 shows. And so many of those people I've worked with have come in and out of my life over the last 23 years. And they've called me up. I, I used to get them lunch and they've called me up to hire me to be a writer on a show. Um, I'm hiring them. It's because, you know, you plant the seed of these relationships, which are just friendships. You know, I think like it's, I always find it better to look at them as they're as friendships and relationships as opposed to like connections and networking because I think that feels kind of transactional uh, uh, transactional and bloodless when really it's just they're they're fun relationships that make a big city feel smaller like a small town and so I think it's you know don't be a jerk, make friends, keep up with them between jobs. When they get something, say congratulations, don't be bitter about it, you know? Uh, when they when their show gets canceled, reach out and say, hey, that sucks, how are you doing? You know, just be a person. And I think that kind of stuff, rather than kind of going, okay, I'm gonna go out to this event and I'm gonna meet five people and I'm gonna make sure I get contact information. I think that stuff falls away. But I think just being interested in other people and establishing relationships and keeping up with them is, ultimately what really helps you as you build your as you build your career in this town. Great. And Sherry, please tell us your story. I have to say I can't agree with you more. I mean, it's one of those things, um, it feels so fake. I don't know anybody. Hi, how are you? You go to go, go, just go, because everyone feels the same way. I remember when um, I got to LA, I didn't know a soul. I was fresh from Europe. I felt that I was the best animator on the planet. I was not, I could animate chickens and that's it. That's it. And I didn't know what to do. And so what I did was um, I went to, um, I was, I didn't even uh, go to UCLA yet. I wasn't a student there yet, but I went to their housing office to try to find a place to live. And there was a lady standing next to me. And I just, again, big mouth, no pride. I had already started acting. And I just looked at her and I said, I know no one here. And she goes, you know me. And she was my first roommate in LA. And then, um, and then I started, uh, we didn't have the internet. We had something called the Black Book, which was a big, huge, black, shiny book that listed all the commercial agencies and all the animation studios. And I started calling cold. Again, no pride, I just called, hello. And I, I didn't even say, I, they said the da, 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 agency. And I said, hi, Sherry Pollock here looking for a job. You know, they thought that was funny and they brought me in. And so, and then I just started saying hello to everyone I was meeting every day, every day. Sure, some people are going to just grab their children and run away because of this crazy lady. But in the end, um, I met lifelong friends. And then in school, lifelong friends. Be nice. Always be nice. Why, why not be nice? You know, you're going to run into people who aren't good material write it down, you know? So it's, 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 um, it's a cyclical thing, but always be nice, always. It's, it's stupid not to be. That's great. Well, thank you for that networking advice. I know that all the 
viewers are thrilled that you will be posting your personal cell phone numbers at the end of this call. So much appreciated there. So uh, you don't get to where you are sitting in those chairs without a few people along the way saying no. How do you survive? What advice do you have for people in a culture and a business that is notorious for being tough, really tough? Uh, Laura, please. Um, you know, uh, Dexter and Sherry, I think we talked about this a little bit the other day, getting ready for this. And I was saying as a writer, you have to, I think most writers have this deep well of insecurity and uh, fear that people are going to find us out of who we really are. Uh, combined with just an insane sense of self, because you can't just think that you're going to write television when it's so hard to do. And so I think you have to just, you have to maintain that when everybody is telling you no, when you don't get the job and you feel like it really was because they just didn't like your personality. That's a, that's a hard one to take, but you just have to tell yourself, I can still do this. And that's one person's opinion. And I mean, everything in, in with creativity, writing, it, it's so subjective. And so something that one person doesn't respond to in you could be the, the thing that you go on another meeting and they go, oh my God, we're, we're, soul, we're creative soulmates. I want to work with you for the next 20 years. And so I think it's just, you're going to get knocked down a lot. It's not, it's not a job where like you get it, you have it for 30 years and you retire. You're constantly starting over. So you just have to have the ability to dust yourself off and believe in yourself when the whole world is telling you that you shouldn't uh, and keep going because, you know, and then on the flip side, when you're doing well and people are telling you, oh my God, you're great. Oh, how did you, you also have to go like, you're not so great. Just calm down. You know, you have to keep that equilibrium of like, believe in yourself and don't believe your hype, your own hype too much. And it should keep you in a, like a good middle place to have a long career. Thank you. And Sherry? I have to, I can't agree more. Um, it was, it's been interesting. I'm always, I'm always taken aback when um, students might ask me, um, well, what if I have, I've been interviewing five jobs in a row and I don't get it. And I said, well, you go for six. You know, you can't, you can't really, I mean, this is what chocolate and coffee is for. I mean, you, you do things to make yourself feel better. You call your friends, you definitely call your friends and you do your best not to take it personally. I mean, that's all, that's all you can do. I always tell myself it could be worse. I could be an actress. You know, it could, it could be, it could be so much worse. Um, and I actually started flip, I, I got no's all the time, but I started flipping it thinking, oh, this is not the job for me. You know, you can't, um, sure, you're only human. You're going to feel bad. No one wants to hear no. You know, I remember I met this one nincompoop. I mean, this guy who said when I was, I did some stand up comedy and he comes to me later, I was in grad school and he says to me, I guess you think you're funny. <laughs> And I had so many comebacks, but I was so taken aback and people were, my friends were standing around, what's she gonna say, what's she gonna say? And I just, I just said to him, never seen a girl before? Hmm. You know, I just said, let me just, you know, you just kinda, yeah. And that again, did I have to hurt him? Well, in my, I went up to him later and I said, I'm so sorry. And, and he said, never talk to me again or something. I don't, I don't know. And I wrote all this down. I mean, so it's all good material, but regarding no's, welcome to the arts. That's just what it is. Right. You know, well, Sherry, sorry, Sherry, just, you reminded me when you said it's so true because I remember, I think my first child was around one and I went in for a meeting on a show that I really want to work on, really wanted to work on and it was going pretty well. And then I just mentioned that I had a, a kid and it was like the guys, the light just went out in his eyes and he said, oh, you have a kid. And you could just feel the temperature in the room change. And I left that meeting and I knew I didn't get it. And I was kicking myself. I was like, why did you tell him you had a child? As if that's something that you just, don't, I could just work on your show for nine months and not tell you. But, you know, I, I, I came around to exactly what Sherry was saying, which was, no, it's, it, it wasn't the job for me. And thankfully he showed me that. And I, and I felt a lot better about it. And then my friends ended up working on the show and it was a nightmare and they worked every night till two or three in the morning and they, and I never would have seen my kid. So thank God I mentioned him, you know, let people show you who they are. And when they do you, it's, you can take that as, yeah, this just wasn't the place for me. There is a place for me and I'm going to keep moving forward and I'm not going to look back. That's so true. If I can piggyback on top of that, I was working in a job and I happened to be the only female. It happens. It happens. And we were, we were editing and we lost like 300 feet of footage, which is a lot. I won't get into the frame by frame, but it's a lot. And um, there were about 10 guys in the room and me, 
and I happened to be directing this episode of a TV show. And he turned to me in front of everybody and said, are you going to cry? And I just said, no, are you? And we, and we got pizza and we got it done. But the thing is, that stuff's going to happen. It's going to happen. And to this day, I'm grateful because he showed me who he was, you know? And yes, I see him around town and um, I see him on Zooms and he's looking for work. Just be nice, people. Be nice. Now, since you both kind of brought it up in each of your own experiences, you can't ignore the question, what's it like being a woman in entertainment and coming up to the ranks? What's that, what, the, what has that experience been, Laura? Um, it's, it's been hard at times, things are getting better, but I think especially in the world of comedy, there was sort of a, just a knee jerk reaction that women aren't funny. And so you go into a room, uh, at every new job, if you're helping out on someone else's pilot, if you're in a meeting, having to prove something that a male writer doesn't necessarily have to prove. They walk in and people just go, oh, he must be funny. And with a woman, it's a little more of, okay, prove it to me. And so I think it put a real chip on my shoulder um, that I was going to go into every room and be the funniest person there and be undeniable. And just say, there's no way you're going to be able to just go, oh, she's, she's a girl, she's not good. And so I think it really, you know, it made me angry and it pushed me. Um, and now that I'm in a position where I am running a writer's room, I really, I look out for the other female writers coming up and I try to encourage them and make sure that they don't get talked over and that people don't you know, take something that they pitched quietly and repitch it. And, you know, I just, I think, you know, there's, I think there was that New York Times article about amplifying, you know, like taking female voices and lifting them up and going, yeah, that was a good idea because sometimes you get lost in the shuffle. As Sherry said, you know, I've, I've been the only woman on many projects. Um, and that is changing on Blackish. There are seven women. And I think it shows in the product that you've got many women and many women's experiences. So I think, you know, it's been, it's been an, an, in, an intrinsic part of the journey has been navigating the comedy business as a woman. I mean, I feel like it also gives me superpowers. And so even though there's been, there have been hiccups along the way, uh, I think that, you know, I think, I think you can work around people's biases and prove to them that you're not what they think. And, uh, and just, you know, punch them in the face with jokes. <laughs> yeah, you have to choose your battles. You, you really do. I mean, I, I remember, oh my goodness, there's so many stories to tell. Um, uh, I, my very first agent said to me, and don't forget you're female. And I didn't know what he meant by that. I was pretty clueless because I was so busy. I mean, I, it's, it's just, I had things to do. And um, so my first directing gig um, was a show called Pepper Ann at Disney. And um, he had said, my agent, he kept calling me, just, just take it slowly, just take it slowly. They're not gonna like you. And I had no idea what he was talking about. And suddenly I was questioned on every, every single thing I pitched and the guys were not questioned. And again, I had so much to do. It's filmmaking frame by frame. There's so much to do. I finally said, enough, enough. If you have a problem with me, let's talk about it like adults, but you also have to tell me why. And they never had a reason why. But the thing is, I, I had so much to do. I was kind of clueless. I didn't want to talk about it and go through support and all this. I wanted to get things going. So for me, if I didn't dwell on it, it happened all the time. It definitely happened all the time. Um, they would talk over me. They would use the word she instead of Sherry. I mean, it was just this, this stuff happened. It happened a lot. Um, I have to say, as females, we were used to it. We have a long way to go. We'll believe the change when we see it. But in the end, we have work to do. We have to make the funny. <laughs> True. In each of your careers, uh, I'll ask you, uh, Laura, first, if you look back, was there a turning point, either an opportunity or a person or a show that you kind of credit with putting you on a faster track or had a, a made a big impression on you that you were fortunate enough to recognize and run with? Uh, what, what would that turning point, what would that place be? Um, I've been lucky. There have been a couple of those. I mean, um, uh, one of the big ones for me is that I worked for two years back to back on shows with the comedian Pete Holmes, and who is very hilarious. He had his own show on HBO for a few years, Crashing. Uh, and he and I sat next to each other. And I think that as I was a younger writer coming up, 
I, I would second guess myself and I would kind of, I would have the joke in my head, but I'd be nervous about saying it. And then somebody else would pitch something similar and get a big laugh. And I go, oh, why did you do that? And then I worked on this show called Outsourced with Pete and nobody wrote scripts on their own. We all wrote them together in the writer's room. And I watched the way that Pete was so confident in his funniness that he would pitch anything. And sometimes it was the funniest thing you'd ever heard. And sometimes it was garbage. And if it was garbage, he made a joke and he moved on. He didn't get in his head and go, oh God, now everybody doesn't like you. They're not gonna respect you. He just kept moving. And I thought, oh, I can do that. You just, it's a volume game. He said, don't worry if you don't like it, another train's coming. And I really, I really took that to heart. And I had, and I started to have so much fun pitching with him because there's a freedom when you just let yourself go. Because even if you pitch a dud, somebody might find a kernel in what you said and turn it into something great. And then boom, you got the assist. So that was a big, that was a big moment for me was uh, realizing that I didn't have to hold myself back and censor myself in that way. And that, and I could just pitch freely and it would, it would work out. And then I would say just one more is that after I had my uh, after I had my first child and I went back to work, I was really nervous. But I realized I had a <laughs> I had a I had a C-section and I got in the writer's room and I looked around and I thought, they cut a child out of my body. I am not gonna let any of these pipsqueak make me feel like I'm lesser than. I, I am a superhero. And I so I think having kids really gave me this like extra thing of like, I I, I don't need your approval. I got this. And it really, again, it's just all these moments of sort of freeing myself to be the writer that I am without holding myself back. And then lastly, I was just saying, you know, Kenya Barris calling me up after season two of Blackish and saying, hey, I'd really like you to come over here uh, was incredible. And now this will be my sixth season and I co-run the show and just getting that opportunity to be on a long running show has been, has been career changing. So I'd say those, those three were real turning points for me. That's great. Hey, Sherry? Oh gosh, um, back at Wash U, I had a teacher, Gene Hofel, and uh, he looked at my stuff and he said, and, and again, we were just sort of glorifying our doodles. We, you know, we were, we're just learning, we're 18 years old, moving forward, moving forward. And he looked at my stuff and he said, have you heard of a storyboard? And he was in advertising. And I said, no, what's that? And he goes, that's what you're doing. You're telling a story. And I remember that stuck with me. It definitely stuck with me. There were, there were things that I wasn't, I wasn't very good at. I'd, I'd, I'd see, um, I wasn't good at meticulous design. And um, I was having a lot of trouble with that. And he would always come by and say, just make a story, make a story. You're gonna be okay. And I, I held that with me. And then years later, when I went to Europe on my own to be an animator, I didn't know what I was doing. I had a flip book. Um, it, was, it was very clear to me that if I can get through Europe on my own, I can do anything. And fast forward, I did stand-up comedy. You're dying. There's a reason why they call it dying. You know, it's death. It's death. I remember I was there and I was starting and I had five minutes to go and a drunk lady stood on a chair in front of me and she yelled, you C word. She says this. And I watched in slow motion. You know that thing that happens when you're in a car crash? I watched the whole audience turn toward her and all I said was, mom, you're always embarrassing me. Got him back. And that's when I realized, okay, if I can do this, I can do anything. And I just carried that with me. Very funny. By the way, uh, I also had that teacher at WashU, Gene Hopeful, who made a very, very big impression in, uh, in my education and my career. So well, a great teacher. Yeah, he was. So maybe if you look back to when you first were getting in the business, you are in a culture that every single day you're pitching. Everything is about pitching. There are classes and people that teach how to pitch. What did you have to overcome? How did you get good at pitching? Because you didn't get where you got by not being able to pitch an idea, a show, a concept. So well, how did you manage getting so good at that? And what advice would you have for, for our viewers? Laura? Um, I, I would say uh, repetition, honestly, because you're not going to be, you're, you know, like with everything, you're, you know, you have to learn to ride a bike. You got to learn to write a script. You got to learn how to pitch. And I think it, it's just every day working on the thing and getting better. I mean, you know, there, there's a reason why uh, 
it just, it takes a long time to get good at stuff. And so for me, but it also, it, it goes back to the other thing of just also getting out of my own way and just, you know, going, okay, I'm going to do it. And if they don't like it, they don't like it, but at least I got more experience doing the thing. Uh, the worst part of pitching for me though, is that like, if say you're pitching a, you're pitching a comedy pilot, you go to all of the studios to sell it or to all the networks to sell it. And you're going in and maybe you'll have five meetings in one day and you go in with your executives and you sit down and you go, so when I was a kid, blah, 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 blah with my family. And then your executives go, ha, 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 and they laugh. And then by the fifth one, when your executives have heard it five times and they're still laughing in the same places, you just feel like, oh my God, I just don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> you know, but it's like, again, you just have to like, you have to fight through your own, that inner voice telling you like, stop doing this. You're embarrassing yourself and keep pushing. Right. Sure. So true. So true. I have little tips that I learned. And like I said, I took a lot of improv classes and um, you learn tips. You learn what, what puts you in that powerful place. And, and for me, I always imagine my best friend being in the audience who loves me no matter what, no matter what. And I put myself in her shoes all the time and say, what story are you, are you tired of hearing? How can I tell it differently? I have to keep kind of entertaining myself because I can bore myself. I, bore, I just like, I, am I gonna do this again? You know, and you're, and you're so right, Laura, about the, there's small talk before you pitch. You know, there's small talk and everybody's lying to each other. Lie, 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 lie. I'm your best friend, I'm your best friend. And then you get into it. And the problem is you can see when you lose them and you have to keep going. So these little tips that I've learned along the way to keep my energy, I keep thinking, oh, what am I going to eat after this? And you know, so it's kind of like get keep, keep myself alive. Just I mean, that's where animation comes in. You just you just have to you have to keep things breathing because no one no one wants to lose their audience. No one wants to lose your audience. But if you're well rehearsed, you know you have to find that courage. And also one more tip that I have is I keep something above my desk all the time that reminds me of a time in my life when I was the most courageous. And that's when I was 10 years old. I don't know why, I think they've written books about this, 10 year old kids, especially girls, they're fearless. And then at 12, they hand their brains over to a boy and they're nothing. You know, so you, you kind of have to, you have to do everything you can that's gonna keep you in that courageous spot. So if we come from that courageous spot and you guys look forward, because I have a feeling neither of you are anywhere, anywhere near done. What ambitions do you have for yourself? Um, and actually, if, if you'd share maybe also a personal ambition along with the professional ambition looking forward that uh, you think you're going to accomplish and work towards, what would that, what would that be for you, uh, Laura? Uh, well, looking forward, uh, I think I, you know, I'm gonna finish out my time on Blackish, which has been just a wonderful moment in my career. And, you know, the the goal is to have my own show. I'm gonna be pitching my own stuff this year. Um, but something else I've learned on Blackish is that something that's been really, um, really gratifying about it is being able to tell other people's stories that maybe haven't been heard as much. And, you know, I find my way into that. And so that I can understand the experience that I haven't had and then help people tell their stories. So I think also going forward, I think I want to focus on that, you know, partnering with people who maybe uh, don't have as much experience, but have a great story to tell and getting those stories to the screen. Because I think that we're really having this moment all of a sudden where people who never saw themselves represented on screen are getting to see their experience. And I think that's really, that's really special. And I think it, it can have a really great impact. So that's professionally where I see myself going. Uh, and then on, on a personal level, I just, you know, I just wanna survive day to day. I wanna raise children who aren't jerks. Uh, you know, it's, it's, very, it's very weird that I, you know, I'm from New Jersey and my husband is from Boston and our kids are from the San Fernando Valley. Like they're <laughs> Valley kids, like the accent that we used to make fun of growing up, like, oh my God, like that's my kids. And I just wanna make sure that growing up in Los Angeles around the entertainment industry, they don't become just horrible monsters. I'm with you, Sherry. <laughs> oh gosh. Um... I'll start with the personal thing. I think I think I just I just want to meet more people and have um, gather more material. I mean, I've lived in Los Angeles since '82. 
Um, and I have lifelong friends here and I consider them family. And I just sort of want to um, reach out, reach out to them and explore more with them. And so basically grow with them. Um, you're right, Dexter, I'm not done. I'm not done, there's so much to do. Uh, right now I'm at a Cartoon Network, which is now part of Warner Brothers and um, finished directing, uh, the animation directing on um, the We Bear Bears movie. And we're doing a spin-off show called uh, We Baby Bears. And what's interesting is um, they thought this was gonna be a preschool show and it's skewing much older. And so um, I'm looking forward to exploring this show. And also I'm pitching shows. Again, who knew animation would have this huge renaissance? And so getting more and more opportunities um, to go further with that. I'm looking into um, hybrid projects, animation and live action. Uh, and basically use, using everything, if, I feel like now's the time. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's very interesting. Um, there's, there's a new life to entertainment now. And um, uh, bringing in, uh, just basically exploding stereotypes as much as we can. It brings more material. And frankly, it does the heart good, finally. Finally, we can, we can uh, create characters that are not stuck in, um, in this, this narrow box, which has been crazy. I mean, when I look at it, I look at anyone, any character that's, that's over 35 as seen as prejudiced, decrepit, and pissed off all the time. You know, so I think, uh, I think we can explore that more. And, uh, and um, I'm very excited for that because now ears are open. I'm very hopeful, very hopeful for the future and for the future of storytelling. I mean, we're not done. Right, right. So there's an interesting question that just popped up, which I'll, in the time we have, I'll, I'll throw your way, which is both of you have worked obviously for big networks and big studios and such, but did you work on projects that were more indie, small? And if you decided to do them, uh, how did you make that decision based on what? Sherry, why don't you start? I worked on a project called God, the Devil and Bob, which was um, a primetime show that I think 12 people saw. Uh, the religious right uh, sent us, uh, or 13? Hmm? Uh, the religious right uh, sent us uh, death threats because we animated God and he tended to look like Jerry Garcia. But you know, it just it just happened. It, God, we gave him a girlfriend, which was played by Elizabeth Taylor. I mean, we did, it was a primetime show. It was satire and um, America wasn't ready for that. Um, now it would do very well, um, but um, it's it's interesting because um, this was this was a small story, and it was a war between the devil and God, and God always won, and the devil looked like an idiot. I don't know what the problem was, uh, but it was it was um, it's still one of my favorite shows uh, because it was it was uh, smart. It didn't talk down to anyone, and the devil launched into Barbara Streisand songs. What what could be worse than that? It was a wonderful show. Laura. Um, you know, I, I have not, honestly, everything I've done has been studio network, like, but you know, I think there's not a ton of, uh, there's not as much of indie television as there is indie film. Um, I think that, you know, if I was coming into the business at a different time, I probably would have grabbed an iPhone and started making my own shows, but that, that technology wasn't really available when I first came out here. Um, so yeah, you know, I'm just a, I'm just a tool of the, in the machine. <laughs> I don't know. There are there tools in the machine? Um, so yeah, my all of my experience has really been from inside the studio system. So I, I cannot answer, uh, I cannot answer to that one. But you know, maybe who knows? Maybe the next thing is indie. You, you never know. You never know. In this Simpsons. Business. Simpsons started as a as an indie. The Simpsons was a very. It was a, they were shorts for the Tracy Ullman show, and they were drawn hilariously. I mean, and they were. Um, it was. It was very. Um, it was very groundbreaking and that they took risks, risks of humor. You know, no one made fun of dad like that. I mean, dad was an idiot. Homer's an idiot. And it's, uh, and now that's huge. There's an idiot dad on every show, right? <laughs> yep. And then we, and we get that note. They're like, he's, 
I mean, he's eating chalk. Can you, I'm like, oh, okay, fine. We'll make him a little bit smarter. But yeah, no, I mean, that laid down the path for a million shows after it. I would say that by the time stuff gets to me, a studio has uh, seen something they like in an indie and snapped it up and then they have money to, to, <laughs> to call me. And then I go, okay, fine, I'll take a look at it. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So for um, many of the audience members that are breaking into the business and, and building their careers, in your experience, it's, um, I think it's always really great to share based on what you've gone through. What are the kinds of people or particular experiences that you think uh, people should watch out for? You know there's something off or wrong when you come up against this kind of a thing or maybe that kind of a person. What advice would you give? Laura? Um, I would say, first of all, trust your gut. Um, you know, when you're starting out, people are going to ask you to, to do a lot of stuff for free. And some of that can be very worthwhile and some of it can be exploitative. Trust your gut about that stuff. You know, um, that, that's one thing. I think I'd say for in LA, always look out for the person who's talking to you, but looking over your shoulder to see who else is in the room. Yeah. You know, because I was always out to, you know, I just, I love meeting people. I love making connections with people. Cause I was also like, I'm in a new city. Like Sherry said, like I'm in a new city. I don't know anybody. I just, I crave community. Um, find the people who are on your level who want that. Try and stay away from the people who don't. Um, my thing as a writer was always watch out for the people who just got into the business to make money. Huh. Because as a, there are way easier ways to make money than to do this because it's years of working your way up, of getting rejected, of being told you're not good enough. And so if you're just doing it for money, ugh, find, find people who are in it because they love the work. Wh whatever it is, you know, it could be somebody who is so passionate about set design and they, you watch a show together and they go, look at the way they put that lamp there. Oh my God. It's just like, you know, you want like find people who are passionate about the business who aren't here for the short term and just, you know, lock in that support system. And, and then when you run into people in situations that feel funny, you are a grown up. you can walk away. You don't owe people anything. I mean, if you have a contract, I guess you do, but like, <laughs> but even, you know, I, I remember I was in a situation years ago with a studio where they said, you know, we just, we thought we had a relationship and they really made me feel guilty about how I was treating a multi-billion dollar company. And then the next year we were in a situation where uh, a project didn't sell and they said, oh, well, good luck next year. And it was a real wake up call to go, oh, they, they don't care about me. And it's not in a mean way. It's just, it's, it's a corporation. So look out for yourself and don't let other people tell you, you have to do this. You have to do that if it doesn't feel right to you. Thank you. Sherry? So true. So true. You have to trust your gut. You really do. And also there's a fine line. Don't assume you're going to meet enemies right away. Give people a chance. Listen. Definitely listen. But also just know that it's going to be okay. You know, you're, you're going to be all right. I think... Um, uh, to me, everything is third grade playground. You know, you can, you can tell in a minute, the means kids, the nice kids, the shy kids, and trust yourself. And again, I call it friend editing. You know, sometimes, sometimes you kind of have to let go of someone if they keep showing you, yeah, they might be using you for who you know. I mean, again, it's right back to third grade. You just kind of have to trust yourself. You know, it's, it's, um, you have learned it, it's it's not it's not been for naught. You know all these experiences. Again, it's good material. It's good storytelling, but um, you kind of have to be ready for anything, and just know you'll survive. You know, and also this. I want to talk about just just for a second this blessing curse of needing to create all the time. You know, we that that's a good thing. That's a good thing. I mean, it can make you crazy, but um, you're never going to run out of. Uh, ideas. Just trust yourself that you have learned something. And also don't be afraid to delegate. When, when you find yourself in a supervisor position or what we call above the line or something, you don't have to do it all yourself. I am thrilled when I can surround myself with people who know what they're doing and, and hand it off. And I'm also thrilled, even when I teach, I, I, I thought I was too self-absorbed to teach. I really did. And when I started teaching and when the light would dawn in a student, oh, I was so happy. I mean, it made me feel so good. And I was even more inspired to create. So it's always full circle. 
you know, but again, Laura, you said it, you have to trust yourself. Well, and Sherry, you said something too, that I just wanted to echo. I think that, you know, sometimes people look at the movies and TV and you hear about creators and showrunners and directors, and it seems like they did it all themselves. And it couldn't be further from the truth. It's such a collaborative business. You know, you really, you have to be able to play well with others, much like third grade. And so I'd say like, in terms of your question, Dexter, about what to look out for, I think, you know, you gotta look out a little bit for the people who say they can do it all themselves because it's not a recipe for success. I mean, you, you know, my name might be on an episode of Blackish that I wrote it, but really 15 people helped write that episode and came up with the idea. And then 150 people on stage brought it to the screen. And I can't take credit for all of that. I can take credit for my little part, but look, look out for anyone who tries to take all the credit for it because this business is so collaborative that nobody can do it by themselves. And that's what makes it so much fun too. There is fun involved. I mean, there's a lot of work, but there's fun. Oh my God, do we laugh? We do a lot of laughing, you know, and that's that's really what I look for. That's why I like theater so much as a kid. You know, you're all in it together. You're definitely in it together. And also there's something that's why I liked improv so much because when you're alone on the stage, you don't know what to do. There's oh there's always something, there's always something. Go throw up that gives the next person something to work with. And when in doubt, die and then they can carry you off. So there's always, there's always a way out. If there's one thing uh, in the time that we spent together in this call and an and, and earlier call is that you both have really great senses of humor and God knows you've probably had to keep them under circumstances. Would you share with our audiences uh, a moment or uh, when that sense of humor really was valuable to you? Sherry? Well, I always go back to that stand-up experience when the lady called me a C word and I said, mom, you're always embarrassing me. And whenever, you know, I, you gotta laugh, you gotta laugh. I remember crying at home and somehow, I, women do this a lot. We cry, we look in the mirror when we're crying. And I thought, look at that face, huh? What can I do with that? So it just, it, it just, I'm always, you know, it's, 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 it's a hard question to answer, but um, but it's a, it's a good question. It's definitely it's definitely a good question. I think I think um, you just have to. I, I'm going back to trusting yourself. You know, things are always going to work out. Mm -hmm. yeah. Laura, um, I think you know, speaking as sort of an awkward, late blooming kid who uh, boys were not interested in and had a just a a, a tight ball of self loathing. I think I realized at a young age that like I thought you know boys might not want to kiss me, but I can make them laugh. <laughs> and that was how that was how I found my place to fit in. So from a very young age, it was like I, I can be I know I can walk into a room and be funny and find my place there. And so that has sort of sustained me uh, throughout. And then, you know, as a grown up now, unfortunately, we go through things and, you know, we have these moments of, of tragedy, unfortunately. And then recently my friend had a personal tragedy and I'm not I'm not great at, uh, at wisdom but I knew I, could, I was great at making her laugh and giving her a moment to feel better. And I sort of made it my job that like, I was, gonna, I was gonna post stuff on Facebook that hopefully she would see it and like it and it would give her a little moment in her day. And so I think just, you know, it's been a constant throughout my life that it's like, if I can make myself feel better and if I can make other people feel better and laugh for a minute, that's, you know, I did my job. Right, right. You know, it's funny, I feel the same way. In my house, um, we're all New Yorkers. I was raised in the Midwest, but um, we're all New Yorkers. So that means we talk fast and loud. And the, the whole point of eating dinner together as a family was to make mom laugh so much she had to go to the bathroom. I mean, that's, that's, that's how I was raised. It's just kind of like, what's funny, what's funny, what's funny. It wasn't a competition. We just no, loved you the build on each other. You, yeah, it's collaborative. It definitely is collaborative. And that's, that's one of the reasons why I think I love um, TV and movies. It's a visual form. You can, you don't even need dialogue. You know, you can, you can just, the way someone moves, it's hilarious. Watch a bird walk, watch <laughs> a bird walk. You know, it's not a straight line. It's, it's, they always have to bounce around. I mean, it's, it's an interesting thing. And then watch a hippopotamus walk. And then watch your dad. You know, everything's related. That's very funny. Well, last question for you both. We started on the topic of story, and I think we should we should close on that topic. What are your favorite 
stories to tell? What speaks to you? You know, the great themes of unrequited love and you can go to Aristotle and you can go to Spider-Man, but what kind of stories speak to, to each of you? Laura? Um, gosh, God, that's a big question. Um, I love telling stories of where you dig into little moments that don't seem like much and then just go deep and, and pull out all the threads of it. And I, and I love telling stories about characters who think they're the hero when they're not, you know, <laughs> people who are so sure of themselves, you know, I mean, so much of Blackish is our lead character, Dre, taking a stand and by the end of the show, having to admit he was a fool. You know, it's, as he learns more and more about himself. So I just think, you know, in general, telling funny stories about flawed characters who don't realize their flaws, I think sets you up for, for just endless, endless episodes of television. That's great. That's great. And Sherry? I love, um, I love putting a spotlight on imperfection. I think there's, there's so much, um, uh, there's so much in a, in a relationship with two people, with two characters and um, showing their, again, showing their flaws, showing their flaws and showing how they deal with it. You know, and again, it's, I'm very much into uh, symbiosis. Everything is related to everything else. And so um, it, you can see so much in the silences and the pauses and the timing. I'm always looking for timing also. Um, you can have you can have characters saying absolutely nothing. One might blink, and the other one could say, "I don't like your tone." <laughs> no, it's uh, there. There's there's so much that people imagine and people assume, and I love diving in deeper to that and and creating this this imaginary world where people assume so much and it's not even there. So this is my long way of saying I love surprises. Uh huh. That's great. Thank you. Thank you both. I just want to share with our audience that uh, I encourage all of you to reach out to the Swashu community because I haven't had a chance to meet Laura and Sherry uh, up until recently for this call. And it turns out that Laura is a, basically a neighbor of mine. I, I, Laura, I always wondered who lived in that huge house down the street. <laughs> And then Sherry and I went to college together, and we're both now connected to, uh, to Warner Brothers. So it's a small world. It's smaller if you're in entertainment. So reach out to the community, and I think you'll find some uh, surprises literally right around the corner. So I want to thank you, uh, Laura, and I want to thank you, Sherry. This was fantastic. Thank you for sharing your experiences, your time, and your success with, with all of us. And for everyone viewing, we encourage you to visit the virtual connection page on our website. We can learn about other ways to connect with WashU alumni, students, friends, and family. The link will be in our chat and the page is updated regularly. So I'd like to thank all of you and wish you a great rest of your day. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>